I just felt like he was giving me perspective on what happened with Lazarus was a foretelling of the, of the resurrection because it was the week right before Jesus dies, right? That's, that's when they're at the house. It's right before Passover, the following Friday is when Jesus is at the house and, and Lazarus is resurrected. And, and it would be like Jesus to do that, to give us an image in the natural of what was going to take place in the supernatural, right? And let's see if that, if that, if that bears witness with you. So we go back to John 11, 1. I, I already told you that in John 10 is when Jesus said, Mary has made the better choice to sit at my feet, and Martha was in the kitchen. So now we see in 11, in the village of Bethany, there was a man named Lazarus and his sisters, Mary and Martha. Mary was the one who would anoint Jesus' feet with costly perfume and dry his feet with her hair. Isn't that great that John would want to point that out to us? How many know that's extravagant worship of the Lord? She took something that Judas looked at and said, oh, what a waste. And she said, no, I'm going to pour out my best for the Lord. And, and it was a symbolic thing, right? We know that. We'll get there. But John felt it necessary to say, you know, that was an all-star on our team. Mary was an all-star. She was sitting at his feet in the kitchen. Even I'm sorry, when Martha was in the kitchen. And part of why Martha was upset is my conjecture, but it's backed by some good theology. Part of why Martha was upset that Mary was in the kitchen is because women weren't supposed to be in with the men. Women weren't allowed to learn how to, how to read and write, and here Jesus is letting her sit in right with the rest of the guys. And nobody else, amen, nobody else had the revelation to be written about, talked about 2,000 years later. There's no man that brought costly perfume and put it on the feet of Jesus. But this woman sure knew what it was like to do extravagant worship. Yeah. Do you think it was a waste for her to pour that oil? Mm -mm. Not a waste. Not in the kingdom economy. There's a different economy than, the, than earth, and we'll get there. But he points it out. So his sister sent a message to Jesus because Lazarus got really sick. They said, Lord, our brother Lazarus, the one you love, is very sick. Please come. And when he heard this, he said, this sickness will not end in death for Lazarus, but will bring glory and praise to God. This will reveal the greatness of the Son of God by what takes place. And I wondered about why he waited, and I'm sure, you know, we've all read different things, and I don't know that, you know, I've learned, I've been a Christian almost 40 years now, and things that I knew to be true my first year, it's not that they weren't true. The Lord has just unpacked some more additional revelation, right? And, and that's, you, know, you hope that never changes. You don't, you don't err from the true north compass, but he shows you more degrees and, and different dimensions of the same truth. Okay, I hope that doesn't sound like a heretic, but this is one of them. What, why did he wait? And, you know, I'll just tell you what I felt like he showed me this, this time, week as I was studying. He said, this will bring praise and glo bring glory. Let's just read it again. The sickness will not end in death for Lazarus, even though he would die, but it won't end in death for Lazarus, but it will bring glory and praise to God. This will reveal the greatness of the Son of God by what takes place. All right, then you jump to verse 21, and Jesus arrives there, and Martha's the first one to come out and meet him, and John goes to the detail of telling us that Mary waited behind, which lets you know that she's really disappointed. And, and just grieving over the loss. Martha runs out to meet him. That's fine. That's good. Mary was just a little bit more heartbroken, I would say. So she says, my Lord, if only you had come sooner, my brother wouldn't have died. But I know if you were to ask God, even now, anything, he would do it for you. Jesus told her, your brother will rise and live. <laughs> and you know the next part. I'm sure you know this. Yes, she said, he will rise with everyone else on Resurrection Day. Martha, Jesus said, you don't have to wait until then. I am the resurrection. <laughs> and I am the eternal, the life eternal. Anyone who clings to me in faith, even though he dies, will live forever. I mean, I'll tell you, this is a couple weeks worth of teaching. We'll unpack it as time goes by, but... You know, Martha represents that part of our life that has to function and has to go on and doesn't always get the deep amount of time that we think we need. Half the time, I would say, the things we're busy about are not nearly as important 
as the things we would be getting in prayer if we would just take the time to pray. <laughs> and then in verse 26 it says, And the one who lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? And she says, Yes. And then Martha, I'm sorry, Mary beats him in verse 32. When Mary finally found Jesus outside the village, she fell at his feet in tears. Remember, she was at his feet in the living room. Now she's flowing at his feet in tears. And said, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. Right now, it's the same thing that Martha said. They had faith to believe for that miracle. When Jesus looked at Mary and saw her weeping at his feet and all her friends who were with her grieving, he shuddered with emotion and was deeply moved with tenderness and compassion. I don't know about you, I just wasn't given that picture of God when I was growing up in a denominational worldview. He was an angry God. He wasn't a loving father that had his arms out ready for me to jump in his lap. It was more like, you know, when, it, when you get a call from your boss, the first thing you think of is you're in trouble. Yeah. Right? And that's how corporate America works anyway. Like, they never call you when good things are happening. So if they're calling, you just, like, the default setting is, uh-oh, I'm in trouble. Not that way. Let me just say, if you get nothing else out of today, understand that is not the heart of our Father God. He loves us. He's a good, good Father. That's who you are. <laughs> and he doesn't want bad things to happen to you. You heard what Keith said. I know the thoughts and plans I have for you, says the Lord, not to punish you. Punishment is like torture and torment. The, the problem of not obeying God is on us, not him. He, his heart's broken when we disobey him because we're the ones that suffer through lack of obedience. You obey, you get blessed, you disobey, you just open yourself up to curses. It's not that God's punishing you. You've walked out from underneath the blessing. Hmm. So he's really moved like... He, was felt, he felt the emotions, and I've heard so many different messages over the year about why Jesus wept, and I'm not going through that whole list, but I'll just tell you that here he is, the creator of the whole universe, and I believe that even when he was back with the Father, when Adam and Eve were in the garden before they sinned, and they were having this perfect relationship with God, but when they sinned, I believe Jesus was grieving at that moment. He was weeping like, oh, and it wasn't because he knew he had to come and fix it, all right? There was no selfishness in the Lord. It was because he knew that when we stray from the way God gives us, we end up in a mess. How many know that's true? Come on, you know it's true. And, and somehow it has a bigger grip on us than the grip of the Lord on us. So we wanted to say, loose that grip of the enemy. You don't have any place in my life. I give you no place, and I'm going to completely dedicate myself to serving the Lord. And he's deeply moved with tenderness and compassion when he sees Mary. Now, Martha was also upset, but there's something about the relationship with Jesus and Mary that it says that he loved her, not in, in a sexual way, but he's identifying with humanity. And he found a searcher after God. He found somebody that was after his heart, and he rewards that person. That's who we want to be, Mary. It's nothing wrong with Martha. I get Martha, and we need her too. But she can't have preeminence over the Mary side of our heart. And then I read this. Uh, well, actually, I jumped ahead a little. It says in verse 38, when Jesus, who was intensely troubled by all of this, approached the tomb, which was a small cave covered by a massive stone, and he says what? Say it with me. Remove, Remove the stone. Don't you love that? Remove the stone. I have a feeling he was like those African warriors. He just walked up and said, Remove the stone boldly. And, and Martha, you know, you would think she'd be the one. She says, oh, Lord, he's been dead for four days. The stench will be unbearable. And when we were in our prior church, there was a ministry to the homeless. We used to send a bus down to Newark because we were in Essex County. It was pretty close by. And we used to bring homeless people into our Sunday service, and they would sit in the back row, and people that walked into the church would have to walk past them. And the pastor of the church would say, I know some of you might be offended that we have people in the back row that haven't bathed recently, but that's why they're here. We want to love them, and we want to give them the love of God. And just so you have an image in your mind, that's how your sin smells to God. Oh, boy, that was a good one, wasn't it? Uh, don't be pulling the speck out of your brother's eye. <laughs> He's been dead for four days. He's going to stink. And 
I love this part. Jesus says, remember, I told you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God. 41, they remove the stone. Jesus lifts his eyes towards heaven and says, Father, I'm grateful that you have heard me. Now, what would be the thing about moving the stone away to know that God had answered the prayer? No smell. Right? Like as soon as the stone gets rolled away, they're expecting to get blasted. And there's no smell. Because there's no decomposing body. <laughs> because he's alive. He's been resurrected. It's a picture of what's going to happen one week later to Jesus. Four days in this case. going to be three days in that case. And it's going to be an instant and a twinkling of the eye for us. At, at a moment, at the twinkling of the eye, we're going to hear him. <clears throat> Can't wait for that one. Father, I'm grateful that you heard me. I know that you're delaying, I'm sorry, that you're always listening, but I proclaim it loudly so that everyone here will believe that you have sent me. After these words, he called out in a, don't you love it, in a thunderous voice. We sang that song this morning. Man, I love that song. Open the grave, I'm coming out. I'm going to live, I'm going to live again. That's not some cute little ballad, man. If you're going to sing that song, sing it, right? Open the grave! I'm coming out. Yeah. And if you've been delivered from addictions, you know what the grave is like because that thing was holding you in a tomb. And then Jesus frees you, and it's like, oh, my God, I'm free. I'm not bound by that thing anymore. But it's not just addiction. It's all forms of sin that, that hold us down and separate us from God. And the power of God breaks that thing so that it can't control you anymore. And his spirit comes in. And the word of God and the spirit mixed together control your life now and lead you to so much better decisions. Somebody better be shouting about that. Oh, my God. 